So this is the the second of a group of uh, talks celebrating and talking about collaboration, which is incredibly important to me. I think it's incredibly important to all of us. Um, this group are focusing on the collaboration between composer and performer. Uh, that's not certainly not going to be exclusively what we look at, and you're, I'm going to speak about how that bleeds over into other things as we go through. And to state the completely obvious, at any given time, a cluster of composers fill my daily life. In the normal world, which we're all missing rather a lot, they come to work with me in this room, and we have tea or coffee, or I go to their places and we have more tea or coffee, or we go to rehearsal rooms, or we swap emails or Facebook messages, tweets, we Skype, we Zoom, we use Teams. Um, there's instruments, pens, pencils, m computer mice in hands, there's sound files, PDFs, film and letters. Actually, there are quite a lot of composers who have gone back to writing me letters, the younger ones, interestingly, whizzing backwards and forwards. And in the past, the one bit of technology which has become totally redundant, which I will talk about a bit today, faxes whizzing backwards and forwards. Um, Every interaction is different, and for me, every single one is valuable. And I'd like to dig into that just a little bit. But um, I want to point out one thing about the word collaboration. In my lifetime, people of my generation, the association, the tenor of that world has shifted. I don't think it's an exaggeration that to say that for the gen my parents' generation, um, that word had a slightly negative con connotation for all kinds of obvious reasons. It's interesting to see it um, be reclaimed. The baggage it had for anybody born in the 40s has dissipated to a degree. And although, on the other hand, it is shared to say, said to say that not all musicians share my over-enthusiasm for it. But it's something I came to by accident through the happiness of experience, because what's interesting about studying music is it's not really something which is taught you kind of find out about it by accident. Music history, it's, well, historically, it's not something which has really entered the writing about music history. I've spent a lot of time um, studying Beethoven. And what's interesting is the one thing which gets given the shortest shrift and the least attention is his relationship with his collaborators. Um, so I want to just be very nerdy to begin with. So for all of us, Anything beginning with that Latin prefix, co or con, for the Latin word cum, together, is loaded, more loaded than any other time in our lives. Cooperation, conversation, coordination, cohabitation, concerts and collaborations are what we are denied in the flesh with touch and breath and place at the moment. And I certainly, like I'm sure and all of us, are desperate for them. Not only do they mean so much, but they symbolize so much. And I'm just going to stick with this room because even that word symbol is a meeting word. It's the sign by which you infer a thing. I always go back to my favorite etymological dictionary from the 1890s, Skeet Etymological Dictionary. He says that. And it relies for its meaning on the etymology of the equivalent of the Greek equivalent of the Latin co or con, um, which is the Greek version of cum, the ancient Greek, which is sum, or together, which is the same as sum, the prefix we use for our together words, which for Greek etymology, sympathy, symphony, synthesis, syllogism, synagogue, syndicate. When things are put or thrown together, and the Greek infinitive for, throw, infinitive for thrown is balain, they become sumbal, a symbol, literally things which are put together. You can't have a symbol without things being met. Now, Pooh and Piglet talk a lot about this. And much of my um, talking about music, I find myself going back to this. Um, all through their adventures in Hundred Acre Wood, if there's one theme to the work of A.A. Milne and E.H. Shepherd, it is doing stuff together. And if you think about E.H. Shepherd's work with Kenneth Graham, that's the theme of um, uh, Wind of the Willows as well. Doing stuff together, games, adventures, quests, making birthday presents, but most of all, talking about it at the same time and seeing what happens when you do it together. Working with the unpredictability, the happy chaos, the alchemy of the anthropomorphic, or should I say the alchemy of the zoomorphic, of doing together stuff 
So this morning I opened House at Pooh Corner at a random page just to test it out. And I saw this. There was a moment's silence while everybody thought. I've got a sort of idea, said Pooh at last, but I don't suppose it's a very good one. I don't suppose it is either, said Eeyore. Go on, Pooh, said Rabbit. Let's have it. Now, if there was ever a great description of the kind of thing which goes on, the back and forth of collaboration, that's it. And you go through it, it's full of that. Um, so because we talked about making birthday presents, the first bit of music I want to do today, because it's Kathleen's, I think she's probably 21 yesterday, I don't like Happy Birthday, but I do want to play a tiny little piece which a couple of us here know, um, which was a little piece which Richard Strauss wrote for his... Um, uh, grandson's um, 12th birthday while he was helping with his violin lessons. This is uh, a piece I've played far too much in the past and not much recently. So this is Richard Strauss, Strauss's Daphne Etude, his only solo violin piece, as a happy birthday for Kathleen, who's sitting in the middle of my screen. Sorry, it's one of my favourite pieces, but also what's kind of, for me, lovely about that is that the relationship between Richard Strauss and this child is exactly the model of what I'm talking about. So what do we do when we are together, working together? What are the techniques we use to inspire shared work? Well, one of them is storytelling. And that today around this kind of virtual campfire, this hearth is what I'm going to do to start us off, to start this series off. The next two sessions will focus on work with two of my long-time collaborators, composers Nigel Clark and Michael Alec Rose. And I just want to say something about those. There's an important difference between my work with each of them began for the purposes of these sessions. When I began work with Nigel, he and I were both very, very young, and we did not know how to or even that we were collaborating. It took some for a while for it to turn into a cooperative work and a little longer for us to start observing its characteristics. But by the time I met Michael Alec Rose in 2004, I'd been thinking about collaboration for a while, which meant that in our case, we had to elect to experiment with what our collaboration would be from a point of knowing that we were doing it. And I think that's an important distinction. But here's an example of um, finding our way towards it and what collaboration in the kind of uh, white heat of it can produce. In 1995, I was working with Nigel on is actually quite astonishing, Pernambuco for solo violin. He was kind of pushing me harder and harder. It was one of those sessions where we'd begun with a white piece of paper and Nigel came into the room and said, so what are we going to do? I think that's one of the interesting things about working with some composers is both sets of people work into the room and says, well, we've got nothing, what's going to happen? So we've been experimenting with some kind of chunky chords, some really irritating score to as I remember, and he kept pushing me, do this, do this, do this, do this. Why can't you do it? Add this chord, reach here, stretch that. And suddenly I snapped. Now, I'm a pretty grumpy person, but I don't lose my temper that often. But as I plucked the chord, which I couldn't really reach, I stamped on the wooden floor with the chord. What was that? Do it again. And in that moment, the completely spectacular... Um, show-stopping, in, fa in fact, um, finale of this piece, which is based on this... 
I'm not going to do because the neighbours downstairs were completely crazy. Um, that's the, we hadn't been talking about that. We certainly didn't have any idea of a kind of uh, uh, an ending based on rhythmic stamping and cross rhythms. But it came in the moment of collaboration because I lost my temperature. Now, as I said, at any given moment, the collaboration between composer and performance can and does spill over into the collaboration of chamber music and the performer-listener collaboration. And I think both of those, the way that musicians work together when they're playing together, and the way that performer and listener listen mutually to each other, are vital parts of all three interchanges. At various times, performer and composer will be the equivalent of audience and listener and use those techniques. So I want to begin here by accentuating the negative. What is it that we're not interested in? What do we flee from? Well, years ago when I was doing a first of a series of projects with the Zagreb soloists, um, their bassist said the following to me. He was talking about why they didn't like playing new music, and I will not attempt to do his accent. Well, what usually happens to us is a composer is commissioned to write us a piece. A little before the first rehearsal, they send us a score. And then they come to a rehearsal and they sit in the hall and they make a face like this. And they tell us what we're doing wrong. And we hate each other. And we go on hating each other. And then there's a concert. And then the audience and we and the composer all wish we were doing something else. Now, I think that's what we're not interested in. But let's be honest, it's very common in the so-called professional music world, which is a world dominated by hierarchies of institutions and corporations where everyone is coming from a power basis. That doesn't work with cooperation. So here are some alternatives. Now, I don't make any apology for streaking as speaking as a string player. The first thing to say is that collaboration becomes ever more interesting, and this is going to sound a really strange thing to say, it becomes more interesting as a divide between composer and performer appears and grows in the 19th century. It's very popular, and I've done it, to protect, present this divide as a bad thing. But I think that the necessity of performer and composer to reach and to leap across the challenges they started to set each other when their worlds were separate, um, to do it mutually, that resulted in some of the greatest art the humanity has produced. Again, speaking string players, um, all I need to do is to put some of the pairings into my mind. Brahms Joachim, Bartok Jeli Jarani, Stravinsky and Dushkin, Tchaikovsky and Kotek, Britain and Tony Broza, and Britain and Rostropovich. In our time, um, Kotek and Francis Marie Uti, Poulenc, Jeanette Neveu, and of course, Ravel and Helen Morhange, who resulted in perhaps the two greatest works that Ravel wrote, the Sonata for Violin and Piano and the Sonata for Violin and Cello, which she, of which she documented the process astonishingly. She was, in many ways, the first um, serious musician among violinists, anyway, to document that interrelationship in intimate detail. And what's more, to be furious when she regarded Ravel as having betrayed it when he wrote, when he wrote his piece for Jelly de Ranier, Zigan, which she regarded as basically binning everything they'd worked on so closely together in their collaboration. Because, of course, there is, a, there is always a question of territory here. And it's interesting, the composers who chose to leap from musician to musician, a prime example would be Prokofiev, who at various different times worked with Kochansky, and then worked with Sotens, and then worked with Oistrakh, and then worked with, you know, Zigetti, and it goes on and on. He liked his constant changing of musical styles and costume with his pieces, also changed the players he worked with. Um, he needed different influences. Or the, the, the relationship I talked about a little earlier, um, for instance, with Igor Stravinsky. Um, many of you will know that, that work naturally, because it's such, it's so extraordinary, because it also revealed itself as in their relationship as performers together. I've included part of their recording of the duo Contretant in the resource page. I, don't, I think that Joe's probably put it in the chat. It's an incredibly well-known recording, but never was a collaboration between compo composer and performer better illustrated than that recording. And I'm going to come back to something Stravinsky gave us a little bit later. But of course, and anybody who knows me is not going to be surprised with this, I have to begin with the greatest collaboration of the mid-20th century in string players, which is that between my teacher, Louis Krasner, and Alban Berg. 
Now, this was a collaboration which changed my life, so I do have to start here. And I've put in the post a link of part of the recording of the concerto which Krasner made with the BBC Symphony Orchestra, um, late spring 1936, conducted by Anton von Webern, a few weeks, or a cut for more than a few weeks, after the disastrous, almost non-premiere in Barcelona, which had been conducted by Hermann Scherken after Webern had run away. In my late teens, I went to Boston to study the concerto with Krasner, and I want to just give you a story that he told about working with Berg. Him telling me this story lit the blue touch papers for something in me, a rocket which is still smouldering, about what happens when the workshop door is opened and the compositional process is shared. So Krasner described the beginning of his work with Berg. I won't, again, will not try his accent. So I arrived at his apartment in Vienna, and he showed me up into his workroom. As you can imagine, it was one of those Viennese apartments where doors open from room to room to room to room, and he went off down through the chain of rooms to the kitchen, where he started fussing about, making coffee, as I remember. And then he called out, Spielen! So I started to play. The Beethoven concerto, like you just played to me. His way, oh, Krasner's way of auditioning me, literally just after I got the, off the plane with the Berg and Schoenberg concertos in my hands, was to say, well, if I'm going to teach you, you have to play me the Beethoven concerto. And I played him the whole Beethoven concerto. And he said, well, you play me a Mozart concerto. So I played him a Mozart concerto. He looked at me and said, you all do. Uh, so his, his, he hazed me to get the process going. No, he said, nein, nein, kein Konzerte bitte. So, uh, back to Krasner's voice, I moved to Bach. Nein, nein, kein Bach, nudeln, improvisieren. And so I did. Berg sat in the kitchen with his coffee and I improvised. And then he started to bring me scraps of paper, which were clearly related to the improvising. He would put them on the music stand and I'd try to play them. And when I didn't get them right first time, he was convinced this was his fault. I tried to tear them up and throw them away. I was horrified. You can't throw this away. It's by Alban Berg. Two things had to happen. Berg had to accept that he might have to wait five minutes for Krasner to be able to get his hands around a figure. And Krasner needed to de-romanticize his notion of a composer's output. I think we all are recognized, so I certainly will recognize and have experienced both situations. Now, as a curious anomaly of the friendliness of collaboration and, shall we call it, non-competitive working methods, is it's possible for a composer to be too accepting or to accept that just because a passage is physically challenging does not mean it is not good or not doable. It's an interesting crossover moment. And I find this is a different negotiation with each composer and often reflects on how they think about their music while they're writing it. The question will always be how much does any given composer want the player or collaborator to have an impact on the material being produced? I was thinking about what from the Berg Concerto is an example of that collaboration. I'll give you two examples. The first would be to do with, if you like, a tenor of violin playing or string playing. Obviously, because of the thematic building of the concerto, famously from the... Uh, from this material, um, there's not really any way that you can expect Krasner to have an impact on the melodic material because effectively it was setting itself to a degree, of course. I know that's a, a huge generalization. But there was a certain style of playing. And if you listen to some of Krasner's other recordings, most particularly his extraordinary recording, which is very little known, of the Walter Piston violin concerto, violin sonata, with Piston playing the piano. And there's a certain kind of lyrical keening quality to his, his playing, which has also got a kind of purity in the middle of all its roughness. So a passage which I would say, you might say, is a portrait of Krasner's sort of playing. And bear in mind, he commissioned the piece, would be something like the end. <laughs> From the first movement. But in terms of the kind of improvisation, I would say that the other thing would be to do with timbral or textural effects. Again, in the first movement, there's a moment where the violin settles onto a, a, a dominant seventh in, uh, in, in um, C sharp. Okay, this. Uh... And I was digging through my score earlier today, which has Krasner's emendations on it. And I noticed that he had indicated that what this was actually, he's written it in here, that this was 
from something he'd improvised, which instead of going on... What he'd actually done was a... With kind of rather um, Zigani kind of thing in some ways. Um, there's a little point here, which is one of the reasons I believe we should find ways of treasuring and recording elements of collaboration is because scores are inadequate. Even the scores of a control freak like Mihaila Trantafilovsky, who's sitting there, who tries to control what I do with every single finger at every moment, even those don't tell us completely what to do at any given moment. We need to get, if you like, a key for it. Um, so an example of um, how this might work would be, for instance, the sessions I've had working with the great Danish composer Paul Ruthers, who I worked with quite intensely over a period of sort of seven, eight years ago. This is a sidebar here. Collaboration between composer and performer is rarely a static thing. It has a tendency to, have in, to go in waves, to, to, to be very intense, and then often to either be broken up with a period of apathy or a, period, or, or a massive fight, like in any relationship. It is by nature, and perhaps it should be, otherwise it's nothing. It needs to be something which is subject to change for different energies. So an observation, what would happen when I go and meet and work with Ruthers is I take the train south of Copenhagen to his lovely little cottage in the countryside, and he puts out, there's more food, coffee and cake, which his dogs nearly always end up eating. But what's fascinating is that he's made it impossible for anybody to work in his workspace. He composes in a tiny shed in his back garden. And some of you will know that he's well over six foot two or six foot three, which means that with the upright piano in the shed, there is no room for anybody apart from him in the shed if you close the door, let alone anybody with a violin. Which means that he's carefully made it that there's a kind of, there's a, a literally, quite literally, a wooden wall. And his collaborative method is fascinating. It's through what you might call sketchercises. He never asks me to work on the actual material he's working on, but sends me kind of half-page models of technical or musical knots to try out on the violin, which I can then try and solve, like solving a Rubik's Cube, sending the technical solution and record it to him. And then he always sends me a letter telling me to destroy the, the sketches. Can you imagine me destroying those? I have quite a stock of them. Um, uh, I've, there's, there's certain things um, you need to be ignored. And I've always remembered the fact that Max Broad re re ignored Kafka's order to destroy um, his manuscripts on his death. Not, not quite the same thing. But composers, if you tell me to destroy something, that simply isn't going to happen. It's not going to work. So collaboration is always different. And every performer-composer relationship will involve different degrees of this mutual interference. Sometimes from the outside, this can look rather distant. An example of that would be the work I was lucky enough to do with John McCabe both over a number of years, both on new pieces, old pieces, and works by other composers, particularly the work of Alan Rawthorn, his teacher, who he urged me to play and record. But John was famous early in his career for an extraordinary fluency of composition. He once composed a symphony in five days sitting in the stands of a test match. This made the national press. And this eloquence was matched with incredible compositional kind of craft and rigour. But the workshop door was, and we did joke about this, firmly closed. Only once in rehearsals for the last few works that we performed, and Mahila was there, did I find a way in. Um, John liked using lots of layers of kind of this kind of style. But that kind of textural stuff was always organised very carefully using layered isometric things. So what the audience heard as being a cloud was always, always very careful maths. And in one moment in the, first, in the beginning of the clarinet quintet, which we premiered, I realised he'd added up one of the parts wrong. One of the hemi demi semi quavers was wrong. I couldn't resist pointing it out. There was a long silence and he raised an eyebrow. You got me. And that was it. It was laughter. But there's an important point here. Sometimes the kind of mutual tugging at material is important. We're humans and we need the kind of sense of that. And we're not alone in that. Um, for any violinist, as I've said already, there is one figure who stands out as the collaborative ideal, and that's Joseph Joachim. 
He needs no introduction to all of us. And we grow up with the model of his work with Clara Schumann and Robert Schumann and Johannes Brahms as kind of the ideal. Now, if you think of something like um, Clara Schumann's penultimate work, the Opus 21, the dry romance for violin and piano, which was just before she was told to stop composing. After composing this in 1853, she did not compose another note for the next remaining 40 years of her life. But if I play you the beginning of that... Now... In the, this edition, I'm working from the first edition from the late 1850s, is a tiny legacy of the work with Joachim, with whom she premiered this in Hanover. Um, this figure is got Joachim's fingerings on it, these finger replacements. Now, any violinist and any musician will recognise the fact that those have found their way into the part, and it's only in this movement that these very subtle fingerings appear, that clearly it was decided that in order to really get the piece working, those needed to be in. That without them, that finger replacement, which, to be honest, in the mid-19th century, that would be a standard, a standard thing to do, needed to be published. So that, effectively, is a tiny glimpse behind the door. Um, but, of course, the most famous thing is the collaboration with Brahms. Um, I will draw attention to a couple of bits of Joachim's work as a collaborator with Brahms, because I think they're really instructive. Um, here's a rather backwards example. Now, for years, I was completely befuddled, and this may sound like, why would anybody be befuddled by this, by this scale in the first movement of the Opus 78 sonata, the... Um, And something nagged at me. It just seemed, relative to what else was going on there, not to be, it seemed like there was something missing. And I understood why when I saw the manuscript and saw what Joachim had taken out. The original is this. A series of fourth, sixth, minor seventh, and then octaves climbing up the violin. Now it's, not hard to understand why a violinist, although perhaps not Josef Joachim, would take it out. It's a, you know, anybody who stood in front of an orchestra for the five minutes of the opening tutti of the Beethoven concerto are regretting agreeing to play the piece, remembering that nobody and nobody has completely got those first octaves in tune will know what I'm talking about. Quiet octaves are not that much fun on the violin. But there is another question here, which is this, if we're trying to work the relationship between these two people, one, why did Joachim do it? Was it a discussion, or did Joachim himself just not like it? What do we get from, from that original? And then the ethical question. What should we do now that we know that? And would Brahms have accepted that adjustment later on? Because underlying this, and particularly in their long relationship, which fractured a couple of times for all kinds of complicated reasons, there's always a question of hierarchy. At the beginning of their relationship, in 1853, when that Clara Schumann piece was written, Brahms was an unknown, pretty much unknown, jobbing pianist playing behind Edouard Remenyi. Joachim had been a superstar since his first decade, acclaimed not as a child, but from the very beginning as one of the great musicians. So by the mid-1840s, the time of his triumphant Beethoven concerto, 1844, um, in London, conducted by Mendelssohn, his mentor, at 12, this performance was already recognised not as a great performance by a child, but the performance which established the Beethoven Concerto in the repertoire and possibly, possibly the most exciting concert that had ever happened in London to, to date. You won't find anybody in the annals of the 19th century talking about a concert with any more excitement than that, and at no point does anybody mention Joachim's age. By the time of Brahms' death in 1897, Brahms was the great, and Joachim would live for another nine years after this. So when Brahms went into his box at the Musikverein, um, then everybody reacted as if an emperor had arrived. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this up was because that was, is to be observed in their working relationship. At the beginning of the working relationship, if you take the 
the, the Opus 1 Serenade, for instance, Joachim cheerfully rearranges that from being the original chamber piece, a nonet with two clarinets, what it was, and turns it into an orchestral piece. By the end of their relationship, the fam- my favourite example would be the conversation around the second string quartet, which begins with the G major... <laughs> With the shallow play, dom, and Joachim saw the score and said, "Oh, the strings need to be played marked piano. The cellos never get get through that." And Brahms gruffly retorted, "Well, you'll just have to try." Um, this would have been unthinkable at the beginning, and of course, the violin concerto, which is the opus number before what I just played, is an example of where that relationship begins to shift and change. If you've seen the facsimile of the Violin Concerto, you will see Joachim's emendations in red pen on the Violin Concerto. And of course, perhaps he had a right, because if you think about it, is an affectionate portrait of Joachim playing... It's, it's, it's Joachim playing the Bach Chacon, there's no question about that. And the manner of it is a lovely clue as to how Joachim played Bach. And anyone who's listened to Joachim's recording of Bach in 1904 will know that it's a pretty accurate performance. Another hierarchy thing. I think one of the most exciting things when we observe the working environments is there's a Larry David aspect to it, which is anyone knows your curb your enthusiasm, knows that the recurring trope in those is the where's the meeting going to happen? Are you coming to me or am I coming to you? That oddly is a really important thing with regard to collaboration. Whose territory do things happen on? Um, with older composers, naturally, there's a tendency to go to them. And this can be very moving. Um, uh, the quartet, ha- over the past two and a half years, has been involved in a, for us, deeply moving collaboration with the great Simon Bainbridge, who I'm sure a lot of you will know is very ill. And so we've been going to his house, and it's a huge privilege, and working with him on his astonishing chamber music, in his space. It's his space, and it's, we go to that absolutely naturally because you know, we're going to the master, if you like. But let's go back to another vignette about Joachim. This is one I really love, which I'm sure none of you have heard. He was great friends with the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson, and the poet's son wrote of an extraordinary evening. Um, my father was fond of asking Joachim to play to him in his home. One particular evening I remember at 86 Eaton Square, my father had been expressing his wonder at Joachim's mastery of the violin, for Joachim had been playing to us and friends numberless numberless Hungarian dances, and by the way, thanks for the splendid music, Um, I asked him to read one of his poems to Joachim. Accordingly, after the guests had gone, we took the great musician to smoke with us in the den at the top of the house. There, my father... And Joachim talked of Goethe, especially of a poem of Goethe's old age, De West Östlich Divan, which is kind of interesting, bearing in mind what's happened with that in music in the past 10 years, that being the origin of the name of Baron Boyne's orchestra. Then my father read The Revenge. On reaching the line and the sun went down, the stars came out far over the summer sea. He asked Joachim, can you do that on your violin? The Peace of Nature After Thunder of Battle. But shortly there was no more reading and no more playing, for he suddenly turned to me and said, oh, we must not read any more, or we'll wake up the cook. She's sleeping next door and has to get up in two hours. So I love this little picture of the two of them up in the the eerie, if you like. And I certainly think I would love to be in a fly on the wall that evening. And it was not the only time those two met, because they shared a mutual friend, the great photographer Julia Margaret Cameron, who took wonderful portraits of both of them, her picture of Tennyson wrapped in velvet, Celestine, um, a Tennyson nicknamed the Dirty Monk, and the portrait of Joachim that she took still hangs on the wall of Joachim's house on the Isle of Wight, Farringford. Round about the time I started working with Krasner, I was beginning my work with Hans Werner Hense. After meeting, as it were, around the first time that I played his, his effective fourth concerto, Il Vitalino Radopiato, uh, for various reasons, our real collaboration began without violin, but just with pencil. I quite abruptly found myself working as his assistant for a new version of his uh, transcription of Monteverdi, Il Ritorno di Ulissi, 
And we used to work on the big dining table in the basement of the house he shared with his partner Fausto in Knightsbridge. And he really endeavoured to make the environment as comfortable for me as possible. He was really careful how things were laid out for the work each day. And I arrived to work with him early each morning. There would be a neatly sharpened row of 10 2B pencils, brand new erasers and coffee served very carefully in lovely porcelain. And he knew this was necessary because there was a panic on for all kinds of reasons. And for two weeks, we put in average between 12 to 16 hour days to solve the problems which had emerged around the piece. But the exciting thing after we sat down to work was that the conversation and the donkey work and the smoking, hence or not me, could begin in earnest when we were comfortable. And there was one crucial moment, and I was really young, so this really has significance for me, but it's a moment which I always recall when I'm in the privileged situation of working with the composer. I was looking at the score, and at one moment it divided into well over 50 parts. And I noticed that there were five horn parts, and one of the lines seemed to be missing. There seemed to be clearly a tooth missing in it. And I pointed it out to him that there was a melody in clearly that line. What do you think it should be? I sang it. Write it in, he smiled. I confess that nothing had ever been more exciting to me. And this is a glimpse of what I came to value so highly, the sense that music is a shared endeavour, and that when there's trust, each side needs to be free to tread on each other's land. And of course, I love the fact that in this, there's a bit of a Henser score, which I wrote. And I think we can point, all point to moments in great works which were written by or suggested by collaborating performers. Um, sorry, I need to... Page seven. Excuse me, I have just got myself in, into a tizzy here with page numbers. Talk amongst yourselves. There we go. There we are. Um, this speaks a little bit to what I said I was going to talk about earlier, which is what Stravinsky referred to as the passport. By this, he referred to the moment, which in many ways is a shibboleth to which his collaborating performers reached after which they became the authority. If you like, they took on the mantle of the composer. And if you listen to the performances given by Stravinsky's violins, obviously Dushkin, but I also want to pull out Israel Baker and Alexander Schneider as two of his kind of musicians with the passport. You can hear them using it. It's there being used in that dual contratant performance. And of course, Stravinsky, and I say this far too often, actually included a version of the passport at the beginning of the, each movement of the violin concerto at the end as well. This chord, that famous um, uh, uh, big stretch, the idea was you needed to be able to play that or you weren't allowed to play the piece. It's a literal passport. Uh, kind of get over this hurdle, then if you can reach that, you're going to be okay. Now, there are moments when the to and fro does result in rather amusing situations, especially when a composer is casting around for material. And this, I'm going to give another story, an exhausted morning in 1990 in Italy, in Tuscany, um, in Montepulciano. It was the morning after a concert where I'd given the Italian premiere of an amazing concerto by the Turkish composer Sudeke Özdil, which had written, been written for me the year before. And I think every musician will recognise this feeling. I was sitting early in the morning on the coffee, with, on the main piazza with my coffee, in, um, uh, and you're just enjoying the kind of Italian sunshine. Um, anybody who knows where I was sitting will know that in the middle of that piazza there's this beautiful well, um, there were kind of drowsy pigeons flopping around the square, and the long stone bench going around the town hall was beginning to get hot enough to fry an egg. So I sat there in my post-concert hangover, feeling rather pleased with myself, and suddenly there was a teenager sitting next to me, which I really didn't want. Uh, Good morning, ich heiße Jörg. This was the young Jörg Widmann. We established fairly rapidly that we had no common languages. At that point, I had no German, and he spoke only German, and I was only useful in French or rudimentary Italian. Within a few minutes, we had established one mutual passion, which was for Brahms, or late Brahms, and Lutz Schumann. And very quickly, we were sitting there happily singing to each other. What a ridiculous sight. Two guys with coffee and cigarettes bawling out the slow moves of the Schumann violin concerto in the town square before breakfast. But that first conversation about Schumann became the model for all of our talk, talk and our work following, which repeatedly returned to this, which is what we were talking about. And 
etc. The slow movement of the violin concerto, which at that point was comparatively little played. I was just getting ready for my first performance. Um, I was completely in love with it. And Jörg said, of course, you don't know what the, why that movement is so important. He said, it's, it's the theme of the Geistervariationen, the, for, for the 1854 for, for piano. Don't you know that? And he laid into me. He said, it's the music, you know, gradually from the German, it's the music of the angels around Schumann's bed, etc., etc. And that, he said, if you don't understand that, you did it through singing mainly, then you don't understand the piece. And I got over my irritation of being given a, a halting lecture about Schumann from a 16-year-old and kind of just fell in love with this sort of passion. But then there was silence for two years, and I forgot about him. Two years later, I was sitting in the middle of a concert at St. John's, and in the door um, opened, and the same face came in. And to my shock, Peter, I'm so glad to see you. I'm in London with my parents, and we saw your name on the poster, and it's incredible, and I'm missing our conversations, blah, 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 all in perfect idiomatic English, which had kind of happened in the interim. I have to admit, I was a bit spooked by his intensity. So I used the classic pairing technique, usually guaranteed to get rid of any composer. Wonderful, write me a piece and I'll play it. Jörg left and I breathed a sigh of relief and a blizzard of intensity had blown out of the dressing room door. I should have known better. Following January, uh, sitting with my pianist Aaron Shaw in the interval of a concert in Munich, we were doing Shostakovich Sonata and a wonderful piece by Jonathan Harvey. And we kind of settled into the backstage routine and the door swung open again. It was Jörg smiling from ear to ear. Here's your piece. He handed me the score, which was dedicated to me, with a terrifying title, 180 Beats Per Minute for String Sextet. From that moment, after the kind of fate was sealed, once a composer has written you a piece which you've asked for, then it really is Brudenschaft. You are bound to them. Um, from then on, his musical world became one of the ways I interpreted mine, whether or not we went on with a close musical relationship. And I, I can't mind saying this here. We don't have a close relationship at the moment. It, to a degree burnt itself out for a while. I expect it will come back. A few years later, my quartet was rehearsing a clarinet quintet which he'd written. By then, with him, he was playing clarinet. We travelled and performed a lot together, stayed in each other's apartments in Germany and London. We talk and, talked, eaten, argued. There'd been lots more pieces. In the middle of the rehearsal we were reading, I stopped, looking at a set of chunky chords in the string parts. These look very familiar. Jörg grinned. Well, they should. They're yours. You'd left that one-page quartet of yours out on the table. It was the middle of the night, and I was blocked, and they were just sitting there, and that solved a problem. I was really delighted. My piece had long sit that hit, hit since hit the trash can, and I was glad it hadn't been a complete wash. But this does speak to a point which I apologise for making again and again. In the collaborative process, there's very little space for ownership. What will be needed will be used irrespective of where it comes from. Let's just think about Mozart's willingness to pass off a Michael Haydn symphony his own when he'd missed a, missed a deadline. There was no problem as far as he was concerned, and you know, he paid it back roughly with a couple of viol viola duets. And also, it's an interesting bargain. You know, one symphony, two viola duets. That seems slightly unbalanced to me. I want to talk now, however, how to the relationship between listening and collaboration. I talk a great deal about my work with the German-based American composer Gloria Coates. And I finished my last talk with her beautiful Bassus. And Gloria's music is instantly recognisable, which is a feat which very few composers have achieved. And the key to playing and understanding it is to enter fully into her world, which is completely like no other. Her music looks ridiculously simple on the page, but takes absolutely years to learn how to inhabit. I would say that the process is not that dissimilar, though the music couldn't be less similar to the process of learning how to play George Kurtag's music. Now, Gloria and I have spent decades talking about music and her music, but I can't really use the collaborative workshop in the traditional way. We normally meet in a cafe somewhere. We talk over coffee or we write letters or email. And our way of discussing the music is very imprecise and relies heavily on other things, on painting and poetry, particularly Emily Dickinson, which she is absolutely, you know, she feels very strongly to Emily Dickinson, almost like she's a kind of avatar for her. Now, Gloria... And I know that Mihaly has experienced this as well. Unlike many composers, doesn't sit in rehearsal or in a workshop situation with a score, not only in her hands, anywhere to be seen. I have never seen her write down anything, let alone a note of music, and I've never seen her read one of her scores. Instead, she sits, usually with her head in her hands, and closes or cover her eyes, and intensely concentrates on every moment Every sound. The first time I saw her do this, I was very surprised. 
But if you think about it, the, the fact that a lot of composers, and I know this is a, mis, is, is a mis, misrepresentation, sit and read their music and kind of tick off whether or not it's what they heard, that is kind of weird in some ways, and, uh, and not, people, not present company expected. But, you know, Gloria's approach is she'll, put, she'll lift her head at the end of it and ask everybody in the room with equal, you know, equal importance, do you think it works? Because that is the only thing she cares about. Does it work? And that's the shared thing we are doing together. So Gloria's approach is a bit of a mystery to me. Um, I have a diary entry, which I think is the closest I've ever got to understanding how she thinks about being a musician. This is from 2002. Gloria and I flew to Munster together on the morning plane. Um, the prop plane, which was from Luxair, was too small for me. And 20 minutes before landing, we ran into the worst turbulence I've ever experienced. Pitching every which way, engines howling, propellers flailing at air pockets. I hate flying at the best of times, but I was determined to be not the only, I didn't want to be the only person on the, on the plane throwing up. As we tossed back and forth like a paper bag in a tornado, Gloria looked out at the literally rolling hills and woods outside. She quietly remarked, with apparently no irony whatsoever, well, the good news is we're really close to the ground. This did not seem really good news to me, and I went green in silence. But that turbulence has come back to mind every time we play, particularly her fifth quartet. You'll see there's a link to our performance of there, which is a kind of maelstrom of Glissandi, every player traversing the entire length of their instruments at different rates and interlocking gradients with harmonics and overtones whistling and wailing around the concert hall like banshees. Gloria's comfort in that turbulence was very interesting to me as kind of remains as a kind of thing I hold on to. But I want to go back to another evolving partnership, to Mendelssohn. Obviously, his collaboration with the young Joachim at the end of his life was a touchstone of that um, artist, that young artist's music making. In 1832, Mendelssohn came back to Paris to give concerts to the Chamber Music Society led by the great virtuoso Pierre Bayot. Mendelssohn first met Bayo 16 years earlier, when he was only nine years old. At that time, in a letter to his sister, this nine-year-old boy described Bayo's circle as very musical, made of very attentive women and the greatest amateurs amongst gentlemen. Now, he came to know Bayo closely through his um, piano lessons with the pianist Maria Bijo de Morge, whose husband, incidentally, had been the Count Razumovsky's music librarian in Vienna previously. Now, Bijo performed chain music regularly with Pierre Bayot, so violin lessons had been organised for the young virtuoso with the great violinist. Now, Bayot's collaborators were divided between two sets of people, the Parisian-based soloists and orchestral players who worked with him over decades. Obviously, the most famous of those were people such as the viola player Chrétien Erhan, who you would know is the person who gave the premiere of Harold in Italy, and the greatest cellist of the day, Norblin. Um, so it was on the one hand, there was those group of people, the establishment, and then in every concert, visiting soloists and composers, who of course at this point were predominantly, with the exception of Berlioz, the same person. Amongst those were Chopin and Mendelssohn, who came to perform their own and other composers' music, and to hear their music played by Bayo's ensemble. And here's the exciting thing. Bayo's ensemble did not rehearse. These salon performances were live experiences of music being experienced for the first time together. Prima vista amongst music lovers, whether or not they had instruments in hand or not. And this is something which has largely been lost. Yes, they were salons, but they were also public workshops, and very much in the spirit of the actual salons which you can associate with um, Madame de Steyl or um, Madame Recamier. Very much, if you think of a, an open workshop listening to music, in the context of the art of conversation. It makes a lot of sense. Now, on his second visit to Paris, Bio had been really touched by the brilliance of Bio's performance of the work he'd written for him, his Opus 13 Quartet, which despite its numbering is the first quartet, not the second. And it was dedicated to his one-time violin teacher. And he was really struck by how well they played it, particularly because the players were reading. And this work includes a sly nod to Bio. Now, Anyone who knows the piece will know that one of the miracles of this is that somehow Mendelssohn was getting, it seems, Samizdat copies of the late Beethoven quartets as they appeared. And it makes extraordinary references to 
Beethoven works which had not been published yet, particularly the Opus 30, um, 130 uh, String Quartet, the slow movement is quoted in it. But the last movement begins with a reference to Opus 132. As you remember, there's the violin recitative after the, um, the quartet player. We have... Now, the beginning of Mendelssohn's quartet begins, of the last movement, begins with a similar gesture with the quartet playing. But the first violinist comes in very pointedly. And he couldn't resist it. Mendelssohn, time and time and time again, when he wrote pieces for his friends, such as the fugue he wrote for Hans Christian Andersen, which is based on HCA, he couldn't resist putting the name in. The only two letters you can get from bio are B flat and A. And you can imagine the little wink that went backwards and forwards between them as Bio had his big solo movement there. In 1832, this last visit, which I began with, there was a concert announced in the Journal General d'Annonce. Um, the guest artist on the programme was Mendelssohn, playing with Bio's chamber group. Here, w wait for this programme. It's going to be a Boccherini string quintet, a Haydn quartet, Beethoven's Opus 30 number two sonata, then it got going. Mozart 20th Piano Concerto, followed, followed by the Beethoven Violin Concerto. Perhaps mercifully, the concert never happened. Bio wrote on his programme, which you can actually see at the Pierpont Morgan in New York, Napoleon à cause de cholera. And it was cancelled because of the plague. And Mendelssohn was convinced he'd caught it. I have to stay in bed, cover myself up with masses of bedclothes, sweat a lot, eat nothing, and endure lots of visits and lots of sympathy. Um, 19th of April, he left for London and he never returned to Bio. So for me, I always love the presence, the, the touch of the salon of conversation about all arts in any collaboration. But I want to go back to Widman and that forgotten tech I was hidden at, hinting at. In 1995, Jörg was in New York and we kind of set up our workshop down the phone lines between New York and London. My insomnia, which is kind of permanent, was worse than usual. And Jörg began his nocturnal composition sessions about 9.30 Manhattan time. So roughly about the time that my practice and reading would be drawing to a close. So we were able to kind of work together roughly between 2.30 and 3.30 each morning. And one night, a sheet crawled out from my fax machine. It's, on the, it's, it's in the resource page, this. The raw elements of a piece juddering their way through the machine. And anybody who remembers music coming through a fax machine will remember how, if it got slightly unaligned, the fax machine struggled to deal with the staves and kind of juddered and it was like a, a, disastrous, a disastrous engine. Fell on the floor next to my music desk and I looked over the score and excitedly telephoned him, armed with fresh coffee. So then I went through this kind of gest, these collection of musical gestures. It's very, all very odd. Just things like one note marked violin, marked violent, or two notes marked clean, ex ex exclamation mark, pure. My name in music, again and again and again, strange similar figures. Violent outbursts. Um, so we had the conversation down the very expensive phone call and we discussed always with him, it would be what is beautiful and what was not. A few nights later and the fax machine began to go again. And this time, three more pages fell to the floor. I rang him up again for another, expecting another long nocturnal session, played it to him and waited for his suggestions. But that's it. You're playing the whole piece. There's nothing else. I have nothing else to say. Now, I want to observe this because I think this is something which is important in the process which so many, we value so much, which is how do we know when there is an end point? Working with composers, what is interesting, of course, is I've never met a composer who didn't want to, if you like, fiddle with something every single time they hear it. I've never met a composer, even McCabe, who is capable of simply listening to a piece and 
not asking for something, being may it the slightest adjustment of dynamic or something major. Um, but of course, these are not, well, 90% of the time, these are not vast changes to the piece. When you go through the workshop process, there has to be something, and it has to be the composer who effectively calls time on it. And I think perhaps I was most surprised, and I expressed my surprise to Jörg, that this was all there was going to be, because until then, everything he'd written for me, most of his early work is um, very much interested, influenced by his interest in um, uh, thrash metal. Most of you won't know that he was actually sued when he was 16 by the Karl Orff Society because he wrote a, a rock opera based on every single theme of Karl Orff. And the Karl Orff Society decided to, and they played it, and they decided to try and sue him for every theme he'd used. Luckily, um, the composer Gunter Bialis stepped in and said, look, you just need to stop now. But that should tell you a little bit about his early music. So by way of explanation, Jörg wrote me the following as an explanation for why the process had, in it, had finished. Working or simply staying awake for more than two hours is impossible. I feel weak as if there is something taking all of my energy away from me. It took me seven days to write that first single page of music I sent to you yesterday. As you see, something is happening with my music. Maybe it's a turning point. This music is silence that happens to have events in it. Intense, calm, lonely, harsh, and brutal at the same time. And then he quoted Rilke. Standing vertically on the motion of human hearts. The piece is a letter to you, expressing my emotions far better than these words ever could. When I came back and looked at that fax um, a couple of days ago, it reminded me of a late conversation I had in my time working with Hans van Hensen, when again over coffee and his eternal cigarettes, um, working on his uh, solo violin sonata. And he said, God, I wrote it down in my notebook, one must nurture caesure, the breaks, the breaths. If one doesn't think about these, then the music becomes frantic and boring. And one of the things which Henser had berated for me for when we first worked together was that I had a tendency to be boring because my playing was so frantic. It was one of the most useful notes anybody ever gave to me, that being excited, being energetic, becomes boring very, very quickly. You have to learn to use the other things. And that brings me back to the question of trust, which I have been hinting at. And what is it? that when the thing is transferred. And I've included uh, uh, half a page from a letter from Hensa because it's useful in terms of what happens when you actively have somebody pass the baton to you, if you like, in term with a piece of music. Um, here is your piece. I look forward to listening to you playing it. Maybe you would like to put in special effects like Sultasto, Sul Ponticello, and what have you. Do go ahead and use the material the way you consider the best, which means the most effective to bring out the meaning of the whole thing. And that may seem very simple, but uh, there's a kind of interesting, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thorny bouquet in some ways, because what's being handed over, and I think this is the burden of trust, which all of us have when we work with a piece of music, which what attends the freedom to work with the music is an obligation that the freest thing we should do is to be completely in the service of making the music most true to itself, if you like. So before we kind of get to conversation, I would want to sort of end on a little bit of a kind of um, declaration of principles. I think that and now uh, it's a truism, we're all saying it, but I think it's worth saying it. We need, as artists, to take the most advantage that we possibly can of the creative spirit of the artists and musicians and thinkers and writers and painters who are around you, us. We are all here to cooperate with each other, to be sounding boards. And if you think about it, this can be a very basic thing. When 
each side make themselves smile or they get passionate or angry or sad is because something is happening and something is shared. I think if there's one thing we all want to avoid, it's that handing the score over, you musicians play, everybody hating it and each other's situation. This is a disservice to music. And I've been thinking today about one of the disservices which started to be done to music in the 20th century. I think it came to me because I spent a few days working on an astonishing sonata by Philip Janak. Um, the past year has made me very aware of how much music I've neglected. If it hadn't been for the fact that I'd found myself with well, not, not nothing to do, but time to explore, I wouldn't have realised that the music I thought I was going to get to one day was such a huge amount of it that even after relearning or learning over 90 pieces of music over the past year, I'm nowhere close to those things I thought I was going to get to. And the Philip Yarnack piece, which is an amazing solo sonata of 1922, which predates the major works of um, uh, the Hindemith Opus 31, things such as the Schulhoff Sonata, the Veles Sonata, obviously way before the Bartok Sonata, and it's still two or three years prior to the Isai solo sonatas, um, is a piece which demands that you find your way into it. I, one of the reasons I'd resisted playing it was that, because Janek was an assistant of Buzoni, one of the teachers of people like, such as, um, uh, he, involved, he was involved teaching a vial for a while, is it's an individual language which I knew I was going to have to struggle with, and so I pushed it away. Um, but I also know that if I hadn't have had the experience of working both with you know, difficult composers and easy composers, I wouldn't have had the, if you like, the wherewithal to start the adventure I've had over the past four days. I'm completely enchanted with this music. And the thing I wanted to talk about was something which has definitely happened. It happens perhaps from the middle of the 20th century onwards. The analogy would be this. Imagine if you had the art galleries of the world and everybody, time anybody went to say, I don't know the Lenbach House in Munich. Or, or the Gemälde Gallery in Berlin, for instance, they said, oh, um, there were only, there's lots of interesting paintings here, but there's only maybe five or six which we really need to look at. We watch people walking around in our contemporary art galleries, or they look through, you go to, I don't know, Louisiana in Denmark, and everybody walks through the gallery and they look at each of the paintings. And somehow musicians started saying, you know, well, that's really not good enough for me. I don't really need to spend time with that, so let's neglect it, which means there are vast tranches of extraordinary music which have just been... Just, they're just sitting there. They're completely ignored. And I think the saddest thing is that not only does these, this music represent the output of ex amazing people, but also they represent amazing collaborations. An example would be, if you, think, if you look at the two Hindemith, the Opus 31 sonatas were written for the two violins in his um, quartet, the uh, first violin, um, Amar, for instance. And the more you look at them, the more you play them, you realise that what's there is the most wonderful portrait of those two players. And so I'm kind of sort of wanting to raise the flag a little bit for saying that one of the reasons for being excited about collaboration is to make sure that we ask ourselves as artists whether or not we're working hard enough. I'm also very aware that I find it quite hard to keep up with the, um, the thing I feel very beholden to, which is what composers send to, send to me. The, for instance, um, over the past, he's not here so I can say this, over the past three years, Roger Redgate has been writing me these extraordinary caprices. There are six, there are seven of them. And number four scares the hell out of me. I've played the rest of them. I've recorded the rest of them. And muchly every four weeks, Roger says to me, so when are you going to do that? And it's like this, sort of, it's this black cloud sitting in the corner of the apartment. I'm, the reason I haven't done it yet is because I know it's going to hurt. It's really going to hurt. And I also know that he's kind of, he's justifiably a little irritated with the fact that he poured all of this into this piece. And so far, I'm too chicken to do it. And I do think that's another part of this. So before we kind of go to conversation, I think it's always important we ask ourselves how much we're going to gain if we open the workshop door. And if the answer is no, then we should open it wide and see what we can offer each other. So that's what I've got. It would be lovely to hear, because there's fascinating people here. I'd just love to hear what anybody might have.
to say. Um, oh my goodness, Joe's pointed out that when she and I met in the British Library, I was copying that Richard Strauss piece out. Well, that's quite... Th those, I spent many hours in the British Library with a pencil copying scores out. before In the days before you could take a, a camera and take pictures of them, and it was too expensive to photocopy, I copied out whole orchestral scores. I'm so glad I did that. You know, the act of writing music out is so important. Yeah, I completely forgot that. So, anything anyone's got to say, please, just jump in. I need tea. Hello, Peter. Hi, David. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, I obviously have to write a poem now called After Weyburn Ran Away. That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> He said that's what Berg said to him, which I can hardly that's believe. A, but what, that, how would that be spelled in German? I don't know. It's like, like noodling, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's what, he, that's what I've written in my... I mean, yeah. that's what he said. And, I, you know, Jan, N there's a German speaker here. N-U-D-E-L-N. <laughs> so, so, mit, mit umlaut oder nicht? N-U-D-E-L-N. Okay. I'll put it in the chat. But it is mit, o, mit oder oder umlaut. Oh no, oh no. Um, and, and not the same as knurdel. <laughs> Kein knurdel, nur noodlen. <laughs> Isn't it great? And I just love the, uh, the, idea, can you, uh, the idea of finding yourself standing in the corner. And he improvised for hours with Berg kind of sitting at the other end of the apartment with his coffee. And the image is just so wonderful. But, and I think it, as of, 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 I mean, it, was, it, it was, for me, it was the most unbelievable experience i have to tell a story about that so i was there for some weeks and at the end of the time and krasner who was just approaching 90 at that time taught me for um, five six hours every single day and he never sat down and um, he looked at me and he said now my fee is a hundred dollars an hour and this let this this beat as it kind of dropped to the floor and i started adding up and he said all i ask is that you do this for somebody else in 60 years time which was, you know, just an amazing thing to have because literally he just poured it. We worked on the Schoenberg as well. And he had this kind of, it was one of those kind of, he was a believer in the Alan Bennett pass it on thing. He really felt this was a, 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 a mission. But he also said something which I want to convey, which is talking about technique. And there are some, I see some virtuoso players around him. He criticized me most harshly for using fingerings which worked. Um, uh, I think I may have put in the... I don't know whether I put the picture of um, Alex Honnold in the, in the resource page. He actually gave the image of a climber on a rock face holding on by his fingernails as being the image of what the perfect technique at any moment for a piece of music should be. He said, if you are not hanging on by your fingernails, if your fingers are not blooded quite literally and psychologically from what you're doing, you're not engaging with the stuff of the piece. And I think he would have loved the film of Honold going up El Capitan. That is exactly what he was talking about. The grace of that. If anyone's seen the film of that, you know, this person who is quite literally on the edge of their existence, like this beautiful ballet of absolute, and that is absolutely what he was talking about. And I saw that picture and I thought, no, I'm, I'm an extremely bad climber, so I kind of dream of these things. Jan has his hand up. fingering because she also came up with some you know fingerings or, or what initially might look as weird fingering yep. um, but they stop you from just executing your standard fingering for a scale or for a passage and, and that she would refer to as noodling um, just to make you engage more orally and physically if you look at some, if you've seen any of the experimental fingerings for thirds Beethoven was experimenting with, that's clearly what's going on there as well. This idea that this kind of, particularly if you think about, say, 
I, I'm really excited. Uh, for instance, when we play, say, two part rising on the violin, there is a tendency, to, for instance, technically, to play as if each part should have a fingering which makes each part equal to the other, right? Um, well, what's fascinating for me is when you listen to some of the great players, and particularly Joachim is an example, they do the opposite. They play fingerings which technically make the, the, the technique cross over, which means then you have to fight to the line. So you basically, that you are having to actually fight against the technique to get to the line. You are, it's, it's hard won. It's a kind of agon, if you like. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Jim has sent a, uh, a drawing. Uh, Jim Aitchison, who is, a, is an artist and a composer. I'm just interested to see what he said. He's a sketched relation. Let's see. We'll see what's coming out here. Uh, it's not, it's, ha do have a look at it. I can't, at the moment, I don't seem to be able to, to open it, I'm afraid. Um, Jim, if you can throw it into the chat as a as a as a as a picture, that will be great. Um, any other thoughts, please? Because this it's this that was already so interesting. I was <laughs> really interested to hear about the noodling because at the moment when you said it or not asking for the spelling, I thought, does this have the same connotation? Because organists use it an awful lot to describe like meaningless improvisation that happens during a service when you don't know if the priest has stopped faffing about. <laughs> Yeah. Well, a kitchen is a very interior place. It's not the place where you invite the guests into. It's where you go backstage to throw the things into the casserole pot that you then serve them. And it's funny that that, that mirror in the kitchen door of the two processes. I, just... I, I don't know. That's just what came into my head from that very vivid story. That's lovely. And of course, you're the one person, one of the well, main person sitting around here who has to sp spend a certain amount of your time improvising in public, of course. And now live on YouTube, it, it's like Gok wants how to look good naked. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I'm sure that you're. A, a, I mean, it's interesting. You, you, of the if you like of the difference between you know the till ready until the priest deigns to turn up, and when you find yourself doing something which is the genuine article as an improviser. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, which, it's like not having the time under your control. That's fascinating. It certainly pushes you in certain directions, and it can be seen as, as a negative thing. The fact that you, the structures that you build are ones that have to be able to terminate at some point. Unless, like me, you know how long the priest takes about certain things. So you go, I've got 40 seconds. I can fit in the whole of this chorale in the peddling augmentation, actually. So mm -hmm. let's do it. And if he's waiting for me to finish, so be it. So there's a little bit of push and shove, actually. Yeah. Um so, um, Joe, can you screen share the, the, the thing from Jim Aitchison, please? Picture, yeah. Yes, please. Can you do that? That would be really great. Just for a second, please. So, Joe's going to... Here it comes. And there we go. Lovely. So, Jim, this is... Jim, it's... it's, it's, it's could you... This, you could, what is this? Because I didn't read your description. Oh, sorry. It was just my visual response to what you were... To, to your talking. And I, I, I can't tell you what it's about. Obviously, it's two things that interact in some way. Yeah. In various forms of conflict, frisson, friction, intermingling, interlacing, etc., etc. Every, everything you've been saying. Interesting. You, I used none of those analogies. So it's actually lovely to hear fish. And it's interesting that it suggested different things and the whole thing of two and I'm interested to know is the composer the taller one or the performer <laughs> I know which one I think you know. the composer the smaller one the abased one <laughs> oh, the, com the composer is, is, is head bowed about to go out to the left hand side I'm really terribly sorry you know that, that's fantastic thank you so very much Joe can you unscreen chain for me lovely thank you um, uh, it's we love, I wanted to stick with the thing which um, Jeremiah was talking about, which is this question of uh, improvising, because uh, a musician that I particularly admire, and I've worked with both uh, improvising circles and as a composer, is the organist composer Naji Hakim. And my first experience of uh, work, I met Hakim many, many, many years ago when I was a, 
giving a bizarre concert of chamber music by Frank and Tournemere for various reasons, which he turned up at. Um, but anyway, years later, I found myself involved in a improvising concert, which he was taking part in. And I knew he was up in the organ loft waiting to do something. So I thought, this is my chance. So in the middle of the concert, which was, you know, a free for all, people were supposed to um, take turns. I crawled up to the organ loft in it was St. Giles Cripplegate. And I went, come on. And what was extraordinary, of course, and Naji is one of the great improvisers. Let's be honest about it. This is, you know. And the, what was fascinating was that he, he started doing kind of rather kind of Yeha Alan-like kind of chords, right? But of course, what I felt, and it's again, this um, hierarchy thing was, what am I going to do which doesn't mess this up? Because he really knew what he was doing, and I'm the rank amateur here. How do I contribute to something without spoiling it? It reminds me of the you know, famous instructions that Miles Davis gave to his musicians once. If you don't know what to do, don't do anything. Which is um, kind of you know, often, I think, part of the process. And that, that moment, I, it, the concert wasn't recorded, but I remember that we, we, worked, we improvised alone for about 20 minutes. Uh, as being one of those moments when I lo- learned such a lot about not just about music making, but about collaboration. How does one, how do you, how do you get suggest? How does someone lead you? How does, how do they suggest an idea non-verbally? Because of course, this is the one thing I haven't talked about: is how often playing to a composer, their response will be physical. It will either be their demeanour or if the case of George Rockberg, it literally would be he conducted you the whole time or started singing very unpleasantly. Um, and every single composer will do it in a different way. I mean, what's very interesting, for instance, there's one composer here, David Hackbury Johnson, who was speaking a moment ago. David and I have never actually ever worked together in the flesh, but he's written me two extraordinary pieces. And I've Think, I think that I'm getting the measure of what he wants from this kind of slightly virtual collaboration we've had. We haven't had a workshop session on the pieces, and I have a huge admirer of his work and the sensitivity of his mind. And so it's a kind of it's a bit of guesswork going on there. And he hasn't got angry with me yet, but he probably he might do. You know, it's a dangerous place to go. I never will. <laughs> we've. <Well, you better. laughs> um, but, you know, this, I, I think it's also this, this situation, I think, is meaning that I think none of us is ever going to take um, the, the shared situations of collaboration lightly again. I, perhaps I've been guilty of it in the past, of not, gone, not, not picked up on the things I should have done. And now, because, you know, I can't, none of us can go more than a mile away from where we are. We're all, I don't think we're desperate, but I think we're, we're being very thoughtful about this. Um, I wanted to finish with my favourite example of collaboration and things being shared, um, which is this, the story which I've told far too many times, which is that the thing which caused Mozart to write his second um, through to fifth concertos in 1774 to 1775 was the fact that he found himself sitting next to a musician who wasn't intimidated by him. This was Johann Michael Haydn. And when finally Mozart was ordered back with his father to Salzburg by the Archbishop of Colorado, um, he found himself as the joint concertmaster of the Salzburg Kapelle. And, of course, that meant the two of them sat, not next to each other, but they sat on the opposing desks of the first and second violins, which would be joined in the middle. And we know nothing in terms of letters of what happened, but we do know it in terms of output. Um, uh, Michael Haydn, uh, ten years earlier, had written an extraordinary B-flat violin concerto... (laughs) ..which is one of the most exquisite... Perhaps the greatest truly galant violin concerto, with the possible exception of the Reichardt concerto, which is also an extraordinary masterpiece. Um, But in here, Mozart clearly started swapping ideas, as I use the word deskies. And um, it was also clear that Leopold was unhappy about it. Um, One of the things they did a great deal was to write a lot of canons together. Um, Mozart's don't survive, but it seems that 
all of Michael Haydn's did survive, and most of them, the texts are either unrepeatable or they're to do with drinking. But out of this, um, something emerged. And what emerged was Michael Haydn, when they got back, was just finishing um, another violin concerto, an A major violin concerto. And that included, in the last movement, um, a gassonale, a street song, and ended quietly. And Mozart, who is the eternal thief, let's be honest about this, clearly got very excited about this and did that again and again and again. The third and fourth and fifth concertos all play with this gesture. And in many ways, I won't say that he upgraded what Michael Haydn did because Michael Haydn's A major violin concerto is a masterpiece. It is an extraordinary piece of music. But clearly, a little bit like Picasso spending time with Braque, it was, he simply couldn't not respond to this until it was time for him to go off and respond to something else. And for me, that's always been the, the, the model that um, we want to be as open as possible so that things flood into us, if you like. And so for me, Mozart and Michael Haydn have always been the ones. And of course, tragically, of course, Michael Haydn's career went literally down the tubes because of drinking. Um, it was very, very, it was very, very public. And the reason that he ended up needing Mozart to finish those set of violin, of viola, violin and viola duos was because he was, quite frankly, too half cut to finish them. So Mozart finished the set that he was he was writing. It's, it is a tragedy, um, and that's very nice. Um, Jacob, another fascinating composer. What I love so much about Jim's drawing is that many of the lines of energy radiate off the page to other areas, not necessarily back to the other collaborator. A reminder that the beautiful effects of collaboration are not simply limited to those involved in the collaboration, but will be carried on to others. And I think that's I think what we're all talking about here, this kind of these 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 strands reaching out. So and that's great. He's running off to have a composition lesson with Michael Alec Rose right now and Michael will be coming in um, the talk one after the next. So I'm going to call time there. Um, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. It's, I've missed seeing people and sharing these ideas. Um, and thank you, Joanne, for hosting us.